Hi, this is Dr. Gregory Sadler. I'm a professor of philosophy and the president and founder of an educational consulting company called Reason.io, where we put philosophy into practice. I've studied and taught philosophy for over 20 years, and I find that many people run into difficulties reading classic philosophical texts. Sometimes it's the way things are said or how the text is structured, but the concepts themselves are not always that complicated, and that's where I come in. To help students and lifelong learners, I've been producing longer lecture videos and posting them to YouTube. Many viewers say they find them useful. What you're currently watching is part of a new series of shorter videos, each of them focused on one core concept from an important philosophical text. I hope you find it useful as well. Once Socrates introduces this wise woman, Diotima, into his speech, who's going to initiate him into the mysteries of, or the knowledge of love, he's going to address the problem first that he brought up with Agathon. Agathon had said love was beautiful, love was good, Socrates got him steered all the way to the other extreme, where, you know, you see all these, these extremes right here, love was no longer beautiful, love was no longer good, because love desired beauty and, and goodness. Now, the implication of that is that love is, if love lacks beauty, love is ugly, right? And if love lacks goodness, love must be bad. Diotima is going to say to Socrates, well, you really need to think this through. Do you think that if something isn't beautiful, it's therefore all the way at the other extreme and ugly? Or could it just be, you know, let's say, so-so, right? Not ugly in the, in the sense of, you know, scaring somebody off or driving them away, but rather in the sense of eh, not much to look at, right? Same thing can be said for knowledge and ignorance. We'll come back to that one in a moment. There's something in between there, right? And between good and bad, there's, uh, let's call it middling, right? Um, you know, some people are genuinely good people. They have a lot of virtues. They, they can act the right way when they're supposed to, willingly, but also by habit. Other people are bad. They're at a different extreme. Don't walk down a dark alley with them. Others, they're in the middle, you know? They could be good, they could be bad. Maybe it's because they don't really have a fully developed character. Maybe it's because they're kind of a mixture of goodness and badness so in certain situations. You get the idea, right? In between knowledge and ignorance, or wisdom and ignorance, there's the realm of opinion. Hopefully right opinion. But the problem with opinion in the Platonic uh, sense is that you can never quite be sure that it's right opinion, right? It, it'll be right for a certain amount of time. You happen to get lucky, uh, but maybe you didn't really understand what you were getting into, so therefore the next case that you turn to, it won't be quite right. The key idea here is that there is a middle, or let's put it in this way, mediating... Term that allows us to go from one to the other. There's a perhaps continuum, or at least things arranged in such a way that although they may not grade into each other, you know, with perfect uh, continuousness, there's some you know discreteness to them. They can at least be arranged in a kind of scale. So she's going to go on and, and talk about love in this way. So if love is not beautiful. That doesn't necessarily mean love is ugly. Love could be somewhere in between. If love doesn't have, a, doesn't have knowledge, it doesn't mean that love is totally ignorant. Love could have opinion and hope that it's right opinion. If love isn't totally good, doesn't have all the virtues, that doesn't mean that love is, is suddenly at the other extreme and terrible. It could be in between. It, this is part of what it means to lack. There's two different ways you might say of lacking, right? There's lacking totally, and then there's lacking partially. So uh, she goes on and she says, Why must you insist that what isn't beautiful is ugly and what is good is bad? Coming back to love, you've been forced to agree he's neither good nor beautiful, but that's no reason for thinking that he must be bad and ugly. He's in between the two. So love, as a god, love as a force, love is what we're talking about here, lies in between and is a kind of mediator. And then he says, um, well, Socrates says, this doesn't make any sense. I thought love was supposed to be this great God. Here's where this other schema comes in, right? 
Love is also a mediator in another way. The gods themselves, at least as, as Plato conceives of them, and as Diodema talks about them, they're blessed or happy. They're beautiful, they're good, they're wise. There's nothing they lack. Although, you know, of course, we have the anthropomorphic conception of God, and we have to worry about that a little bit. Just put that aside for a moment. The gods are, are, the gods are, are a plentitude. They have everything that they need. There's nothing that they're lacking. They, they're on the, the extreme side over here. What about human beings? Human beings are kind of like I put here a mixed lot. You know, some of them are ugly. Some of them are beautiful. Some of them actually have some knowledge, at least, of some things. Some of them are totally ignorant, so ignorant that they don't even realize how ignorant that they are, right? And the same thing with moral goodness, moral badness. Most of them tend to be in the middle somewhere. Uh, at least that's the way Plato thinks of it. But even so, they're very different than the gods, right? And there is no direct connection, according to Diodema, between the gods and the human beings. There's literally no dialectic between them. Or if there is a dialecticos between them, it happens through intermediaries that are called daimones. Um, this is you know, going to get rendered as, as demons later on, you know, uh, in the shift to, to other ways of thinking about this. But the Greek sense doesn't have any pejorative sense. It just means something in between, something like a spirit in between the gods who are fully divine and human beings who are not divine, who are mortal, who are uh, phletos, right? The daimones are the go-betweens between the gods and the human beings. So as she'll say, they are the interpreters. They are the ones who are involved in making things happen in this entire realm. When divination takes place, presumably, divination is, is you know, finding the will of the gods, it doesn't happen straight off by, by the gods just revealing something to human beings in this schema. Rather, the gods have some go-betweens. The gods reveal things to human beings through these intermediaries. Love fits in here. Love is not a god. Love is not a mortal. He's somewhere in between. He's half and half, you might say. And so she goes on and she says, um, uh, here we go. What are these, these daimones? They're envoys and interpreters that ply between heaven and earth. They form the medium of the prophetic arts of sacrifice, initiation, sorcery. The di divine will will not mingle directly with the humans. Love is one of these. And then Socrates asks, well, who were his parents? And now she's got this interesting mythological story about why love is in between. He says, um, to, to make it really short, love is a, a, you might say, mixed child, right? There's this, um, this god of... We can translate it as, as resource or, or plenty, right? He goes to a party, he gets drunk, he passes out, and then uh, penury or need or poverty passes by, and she thinks, man, if I can just get a kid by this guy, I'll be all right, because I am totally destitute, but he is totally loaded, so I'm going to have sex with him, get pregnant, and then have a, a baby, and then it'll be easy street for me. We don't actually find out whether that's the case. Love is born of both of them, and love combines the aspects of both. So, you know, she'll go on, and she says, um, here we go, as the son of resource and need, it's his fate to be always needy. Nor is he delicate and lovely, but harsh and arid, barefoot and homeless, sleeping on the naked earth in doorways, in the very streets between the, be, beneath the stars of heaven, always partaking of his mother's poverty. But... He also brings his father's resourcefulness to his designs upon the beautiful and the good. He's always after what is beautiful and good, and he's got the drive to try to get it. He's impetuous. He's energetic. He's a mighty hunter. He's a master of device and artifice, at once desirous and full of wisdom, lacking and having at the same time. Paradoxical. Love has... You know, it's not just like a half and the half, uh, you know, in the very middle like this. It's rather love is all over the map. Love is energy. And so as a daimon, when love takes hold of us, love elevates us into, at least to some degree, the divine. It takes us away from our purely human, mortal condition and introduces us to something greater. 
here's where we want to come back to this. So, you know, if we look at this in a static way, especially with this one right here, knowledge, opinion, and ignorance, we can say, well, you've got the state of knowledge, that's great, that's wonderful if you've got that. Then there's ignorance, clearly we know what that is. We're not ignorant of ignorance, are we? Um, and then there's opinion, and that's just sort of in between. The mediating term is where desire occurs, according to Diodema. The one who merely has opinion and is A-OK -okay with that is, in a certain sense, deficient. What really goes on, according to Diodema, is the ones who have opinion can be oriented towards having something more than opinion. Once you become aware of the fact that all you've got are mere opinions and they're not you know, truly reliable because you don't really possess knowledge, then you have a desire to obtain knowledge, a desire to become wise, a desire to become expert in something. And you might say what's going on here is mediation is leading towards or tending towards what it is that it lacks. But it's oriented by that. And by being oriented by that, it becomes in a certain way better in the process. You know, the ignorant, they're badly off. And they don't seem to even care how ignorant they are. That's part of what it means to be ignorant. So in a certain way, those who possess mere opinion um, and aren't even sure whether it's right opinion or not, they're not even really opinionated. They're really more ignorant than anything else. So he goes on, and he says, um, love fits in here. Love is a seeker after knowledge or wisdom or truth. He says, none of the gods are seekers of truth. They don't long for wisdom. Why? They're already wise, right? Um, you must understand uh, that they don't do that. Why would the wise be seeking the wisdom that's already there? The ignorant don't seek the truth. That's why they're, they're so ignorant. He says, what are these seekers after truth, then, if they're neither wise nor ignorant? They are those who come between the two, and one of them is love. Wisdom is concerned with the loveliest of things, and love is the, the love of what is lovely. So it follows that love is a lover of wisdom. Being such, he's placed in between wisdom and ignorance. Who else is placed between wisdom and ignorance? Well, this is where we get to Socrates' profession itself. We often, when we're talking about philosophy, particularly in an introductory class, say, you know, philosophy, the love of wisdom, right? And it's actually not the eros term that's being used there, but the philia term. But that's often used in an erotic way within Platonic dialogues. What does the love of wisdom really consist in? Does it consist in just, you know, admiring wisdom from afar? No, it consists in desiring and going after wisdom as a good, as something valuable for oneself, something worth sacrificing for. Philosophy in its deepest sense, according to this teaching about love and the intermediaries, is in fact the pursuit of wisdom. The desire that drives us to seek out wisdom, the wisdom that we don't yet possess, and to hold on to the little bits of it that we happen to get a hold of. That means that love is in fact a philosopher, and it means that love is what has to be present, what has to be driving to take a philosopher, a would-be philosopher, from the realm of mere opinion into the realm of knowledge or wisdom. Love is not yet knowledge, but love is what takes us in that direction, acting as a mediator. 